Many will seek to enter into the narrow gate and will not be able to. These words should give every believer pause because it's only talking about those of us who are trying to enter the kingdom. Are you trying to enter the kingdom? I would raise I would be raising my hand right now. But he says many will not be able to. This is coming from Yeshua, the son of God. These words imply that seeking God is not enough. Simply being religious and going through the emotions will not get us into that narrow gate that we're seeking. While seeking God is the first step, there is more to be expected and required in how we seek if we are to truly find him. That is the subject of this study today. We will talk about what does it really mean to seek God? How can we find him according to his word? Is your matter of seeking God in alignment with what we're looking at here as how we can get into the narrow gate? Let's tune in and make sure that we're in alignment with that. Seek and find God, the first step in a journey to restoration. So here's some of the questions that we're answering today. What does it mean to seek God? Why is seeking God so vital for every believer's relationship? What is God's plan for man to find him? How does scripture teach us to seek God? What are some obstacles to seeking God in a way that is proper? How can I know if I am truly seeking God? What does it mean to practically seek God with all your heart? How does God respond to those who actually do seek him in this way? First, let's start with God's original plan to seek him. We see this outline in with Paul in Acts chapter 17 when he comes across a group of people who are very religious but don't truly understand God and has even built an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. We see him say these words, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times, and boundaries of their dwellings. Why? So that they should seek Yahweh in the hope that they might grope for him, reach for him, and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us. He is making explicit this God that they said was unknown. He says, let me tell you about the one true God and how he's established things. Listen to what he says. He says he's established and appointed men's times where they should live. What city, what time of the year, what era of life? Why? All for the purpose of this threefold uh, approach that they may seek him, that they may find him or they may seek him and reach out for him and that they may find him. Notice it doesn't talk about him finding us because he's already here and very present. He wants to restore relationship with us, but it's on us to seek, to reach out and find him. This was already in the plan going back to the beginning. For him to seek, for us to seek, reach out and find him. This is no simple effort as it includes both time for seeking and time for reaching. But this is part of God's plan. We see this same principle when we hear ask, seek and knock. In Matthew 7, it says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Why? For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and the one who knocks the door be open. Ask, seek and knock. We've heard it before. This is a plan. This is a principle that he's laid out. It's so easy. And I've seen it so many times myself or others get in trouble thinking that you already know what I need. Won't you just see that need and meet me where those needs are? But we see him saying, ask, seek and knock. I could go through scripture after scripture outlining this principle in so many places. But I'm hoping that it's enough to get the point across that this is God's plan for man to connect with him, to reconvene, to reestablish what was lost. He is calling you and me to seek, to reach out and ultimately find him. We cannot assume that he's going to come to us because you know all the things he's already done all the work. Now the ball's in our court for us to seek, reach out for him and find him. We can't go about this kind of seeking. And I think this is where a lot of times we get in trouble. We're thinking I'm seeking more than I used to. 
I'm seeking more than most people I know. But the question is, are we seeking with all our hearts? Jeremiah tells us this in, in chapter 29. Here's a group of people in this context. They've been exiled to Babylonia, Babylonia and won't come back for another 70 years. He says, but you will find me. Watch how he speaks about it, however. For I know the plans I have for you, declares Yahweh, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me. Notice again, we are coming and calling on him. We are coming and praying to him and I will listen to you. Notice that condition. You come to me, you call on me and I will listen. You will seek me and find me. When? How? When you seek me with all your heart. We cannot miss that part. That's going to come up time and time again. We cannot just simply go through the motions. I think so many of those in that group that he's talking about who, who are going to say, uh, we, 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 we did this with you. We, you ate in our streets and we'll look at that here in a second. But we open up with the passage that says many will seek and not find. I wonder if it's because many were not seeking with all their heart. When's the last time we've done anything with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength? We live in a time now where we want to do as little as we can to get as much as we can. And we sometimes make the mistake of spilling that over into our spiritual lives with Yahweh, asking, what's the least that I can do? But he make no doubts about it. Make it clear and explicit right now as we read it together. You will find me when you seek me and find me when you when you seek me with all of your heart. There's a one solid point that we don't want to miss if we don't want to be in that fold of those who you said you sought me, but you missed it. You missed it. Look, only a few get it. If you're getting comfortable thinking I'm doing better than this person, I'm doing better than that, that person. Many of us are here. We're all kind of in the same group and it's kind of working out the church. I am, I'm in the, the community I'm in. One guy came to him and asked him appointed questions. Are only a few going to be saved? And listen to how he answered. Luke 13, it says, and he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying through toward Jerusalem. Then one said to him, Lord, are there, are, are there few who are going to be saved? Are there few who are saved? I wish I could be in his mind and understand why he asked that question. But I can imagine. I wonder if he was wondering, what are my chances? Are there just going to be a few people? Maybe something in your teaching made it seem very difficult. And I just need some clarification. Are only a few people going to be saved? Note that the type of answers that can come from this question are yes or no. But the way Yeshua answers it makes an even bolder point. Yeshua said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. Listen to what he says. It can easily be missed here. He says, strive. That's an imperative verb, meaning you strive. I'm talking to you. Don't ask me about all these other people, what's going to happen to them. I'm talking to you sitting with me right now. You make every effort, it says, I think in the NIV. You make every effort to enter in through the narrow gate. That's how important this is. No, I'm going to, I'm going to say yes. And no. please don't miss this point. Make every effort to seek. Are you making every effort to seek so that we'll be sure that we are in that fold that says you sought me with all your heart. You sought me with diligence for many. I say to you will seek to enter and will not be able to so humbling. Why? Because we are not talking about the world. We're not talking about those who we look at are among the nations, the pagan, the those who care nothing for religion and definitely Christianity or anything concerning God and Yahweh. We're not talking about them. So count all of those people out this. We're only fixated. He's only speaking to the people who are seeking to be in his kingdom, who are seeking to enter into the narrow gate. He says out of those people, just that group alone few will make it. Wow. What percentage that uh, that has to be of the whole population? If we're only talking about those who are sincerely seeking to enter the kingdom, he says few of those will make it. Look at your church, your church community. He says all these people are seeking. 
I'm sure everybody will raise their hand. I'm seeking to enter. He says, yes, a few. What about this community? Out of that, a few. Now, I, I'm not Yahweh or Yeshua, so I can't say to this community or that. But it does make a heavy point for those of us who consider ourselves religious and are seeking to enter into the narrow gate. Seeking alone is not going to be enough. It's not enough. He makes explicitly here. And it's so much so that he's saying, make every effort to enter into that narrow gate. So, again, the point is we need to seek diligently. Let's talk. We're going to get into what that looks like. What are some practicals of what that could look like? When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Then you will begin to say, listen, listen, listen. We ate and drank in your presence. See, we're continuing this story. This is giving us a good picture of the type of people who were saying we're good, right? The people who were saying we're seeking, right? We're amongst you. We're eating and drinking with you. And you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Sin. Living in sin. There would be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. What? There's no wonder why there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and why there's all this uh, anger and frustration. Because these are people who honestly expected to get in. I'll be honest, I'm expecting to get in. I'm really hoping. I'm striving. But he says of those few. So there must be something that we're missing, that many are missing. I ate with you. We're going to church. We're in your presence. We're drinking from the same cup. We're enjoying the fellowship. What are you talking about? I recall a scripture, I believe, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, where Paul says uh, uh, they were all drinking from the same um, rock. They all passed through the sea. They all did this. And he concludes, I think, in verse 5, where he says, nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. See, we can get caught up in the spirit of all of us are doing this. Everyone, we're, we're all spiritual. And they were like, yeah, look at the world. They're off doing their own thing, but we are here. He's not even talking about the world. He's just saying of those who are religious, of those who are eating and drinking with me, of those um, of whose streets I'm teaching in, of those who I'm fellowshipping with, of those people, few will enter. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived to think that we live in such a state or a nation or I grew up in such a family and we put the word believer and Christian and Messiah and Hebrew roots and whatever flavor that we have on this is really clear to him. Very clear. Either you're diligently seeking and you're sold out and in his kingdom or you're not. Never get comfortable thinking we got it. So let's talk about some practicals of how do we seek him with all our heart. Now I'm going to start off in Proverbs and 8. It says, I love those who love me. And it's speaking about wisdom. Wisdom is being personified here. I love those who love me. And those who seek me diligently will find me. Notice again, it doesn't say those who seek me. It's adding the adverb diligently seeking me. Diligently seeking me. What kind of image comes to your mind? What kind of video clip rolls to your head of you seeking diligently wisdom? You seeking diligently, diligently God's word. Whatever that is, make sure you do that because that's what you do know we need to be on. I need to diligently be in his word, praying, giving, whatever that is, I need to seek it. And we're going to break this down even further. In Proverbs 2, 1 through 5, Solomon continues to speak on this topic. And he gives us a litany of conditional statements that must be met before we can find the knowledge of God and understand the fear of Yahweh. If you want to finally get to that place, he says, consider these things. That's all. Consider these things. And as we conclude in verse 5, of this uh, uh, passage, he'll say, then you'll get it. So what are those things? I hope you got your pen and paper. You're ready to write down. You got some practicals. Matter of fact, it, I put in the notes, a download you can download, uh, you can use to type in electronically or to print out, to copy some notes from this lesson if you want to use that. But 
diligence. I'm trying to set us up the video with the notes to make sure we're taking the time to go through this. Not that it's just a video I want to go th and through and see, but I want to practice the diligence that it takes, that the word is calling me to in order to truly find him. So let's look at it. My son, if you accept my words and store my commands within you, turn in your ear to wisdom, applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then, ah, we finally get to the end of it. Then, then, after you've done these things, oh, those simple things, but they're not, are they? This is all encompassing. It takes everything you got. And, and Solomon is nice enough to start spelling out some of those pieces and what it looks like. What does diligence look like? What does all your heart look like? And now we have some practicals we can put behind that. Then you'll understand the fear of Yahweh and find the knowledge of God. But first, seek, reach out, and find. But first, ask, seek, and not. But first, all your heart. But first, diligence. There's a part that it is playing on our hearts and our uh, behavior that we need to show up first. Completely, completely present. You know, it's embarrassing because sometimes I've given more to the things of this world than I've given to God. I've been more diligent in getting a paper in on time for a teacher or a professor or completing an assignment for a boss and staying up late until I understood it and made sure it was done. I've been more diligent and I've shown up for the teachers and professors and supervisors and managers and authorities in my uh, physical life. But the one who's provided me everything gets scraps. Is that true for you? You've have you have been diligent. You've 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 not eaten. You've not slept. You've uh, pushed aside friends and family and, and whatnot to make sure you showed up for someone else or for some other thing for your own business or for whatever it is, your pursuits. But for Yah, we have pulled back and we've given him uh, head nods of, yeah, that's good. We've we've snacked on his word and not gone deep. We've tossed out this and that of showing up in, in, in prayer groups. This can no longer be. Let's break down each one of these to see what that looks like practically. So let's look at accept my words and store up my commands. Accept my words. What could that look like? Don't reject through disobedience, right? If you're going to accept his word, that means don't reject it. Your disobedience is rejecting his word. Don't say I'm finding Yahweh. I'm seeking him to find him, but you're rejecting him in your disobedience. If there's things you know right now that you're doing that is not in alignment with his explicit commands, his explicit instruction, or his implied spirit, and I'm going to go there too, because sometimes we start playing games talking about, well, it did it actually. And when we start doing that, we're already wrong because we are no longer seeking. We should be seeking what's right, not what's wrong with. When you start asking yourself, well, what's wrong with? Uh, no, we seek what's right with. We seek his righteousness. So if you already have something that in disobedience, your spirit has just been bothering. Your mind's been bothering. You have to give that up. Accept his words. Don't reject them through your disobedience. We have to integrate these principles into your decision making process, into your behaviors, into your attitudes. Not something that we can just say, oh, I already know that. No, they need to be integrated into your behavior, into your attitude, because we're, we're judged by the thoughts and attitudes as well. Does my attitudes reflect what I'm reading? Does my attitude reflect the spirit of Yeshua and the spirit of Yahweh? I've seen many believers in the name of Yahweh uh, either curse them out in their spirits, in their minds or in words all over biblical issues. And I'm thinking that is not the spirit. It has not been integrated into our behaviors and our spirit in his name. How we dress, how we speak, what we watch, what we listen to, integrating these things. Don't reject them. Accept his words. Allow them to become a part of us and we're aligned and united with them. We want to hear those words. I know you, not I don't know who you are. And we just like, oh, I know of you because I heard your word and I know what it says. No, I'm aligned with it. Store my commands to cherish like a treasure in one's mind or heart. You cherish these. You're meditating throughout the day. You know, when I was a young 
um, a, a believer, 18, 19 years old, I would write down scriptures on a piece of piece of paper strip and then tape them to laminate them in high school. I was 18, 19 years old and I would uh, wear them on my wrist to remember. I'm not saying you do that, but I, I was I was I, I wanted to keep it in mind and it was a big deal for me. Cherish them. Meditate on them. Continually amass in large quantities. You cherish anything you cherish. It may be a favorite food. It may be a favorite um, uh, uh, a vacation or whatever. You're cherishing. You want as much as, of it as you can get. Cherishing it. Store those things up. He wants us to store up his commands, store up his instructions like this. Are we reading his words? Are we snacking on it? Are we just doing a one scripture a day? Are we really trying to eat it like meat where we need a fork and a knife to really get into it? Are we taking the time, the attention and effort it requires? I know that even listening to some of this, some of us may be getting uncomfortable thinking about the time stamps that are required in order to put this kind of work in. And again, I believe that's why many were seeking but could not find because it only comes at 100 percent or I dare say at 120 percent. When you've given your all, when you're completely all in, then the connection happens. Yahweh knows. You can't be fooled. Set to your memory, practically. You want to memorize it. That's an idea. We've memorized a lot of other things. Even those with the worst memory remember songs. You could put it in a song. Why? Because it's that important to you that you're going to say, I want this in me. I want this in my heart and my mind. I want to eat it like the honey that it is. We even get to the point where you can say, I know it by heart, right? That's what we say when we know something. So well, I know this by heart. It may be this passage you start with in one through five, chapter two, five verse two, one through five. It may be something else. You may just decide right now, I need to start storing this up. Um, again, as a young man, I remember 1920, I, I, I was working third shift. Nobody coming to the uh, checkout at a grocery store. And I used that time to memorize almost the whole book of James. It was so therapeutic. And today it still serves me to start hearing those words recited from my mouth. How encouraging and empowering. It grounds you in a tremendous way. Since then, I've been able to do so many, so much more. But I want to testify at, as to how powerful it is to put those scriptures to memory. Turn your ear to wisdom. That means turning away from all that is not grounded in wisdom. So if you're going to turn your ears, notice they open one direction wherever you're facing. So to turn your ear toward wisdom, wisdom is not in the same place where all the un unwise things are. You're going to have to go to a different place and you get tuned into a different frequency. You know, wi wisdom is often um, quiet and calm while, while chaos sometimes is screaming from the corners. But can you hear and tune into that wisdom? So this means tuning out some movies, a lot of some music, Social media, toxic talk, etc. What do you need to tune out? Write that down. Pause it right now. Start recording. If I really want to start tuning in, I literally in this season of my life have had to dial seriously back from social media because I realized all it was all it is is pumping in worldly ideas and thoughts. And it's causing me to think things that are not in alignment with his righteousness. It's causing me struggles and temptations that I shouldn't have to have if I wouldn't do it. It's nothing good from it. And if I go on YouTube or whatever it is, I'm specific about what I'm going to get to listen to this Bible study, whatever it is. But I spent too much time scrolling the death scroll, looking for the bottom and finding just that nothing but the bottom. So that's my personal um, uh, where I am. But it's been so therapeutic. It's been so healing and empowering because he says religion that God our, and James 1 26, I believe religion that God our father accepts as pure and faultless as this to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. To keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Stay pure. You're a holy nation. He wants to use you as a conduit that's clean, that he can speak clearly through. So turn away. Actively seek out with wise advice, teachings, principles. Again, you can use videos. What podcasts can you listen to? What wise people do you know you can get closer to? What books are, et cetera? Um, subscribe to this. If this has been a ministry for you and this is tickling your spirit and challenging you and, and encouraging, whatever, subscribe um, because I'm going to continue to post these. And it has the same spirit of challenging us and encouraging us on how we can apply God's word to our life today. Share this with others as well. Um, you may have someone in mind that needs to hear this message. 
there ain't no other message that's more important than the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There is, it feels like it looks like it. There's nothing that's more important. This is it right here. That, that's a loving act to share with them. Not from me, but because this is a word. Apply your heart to understanding. Move past simply knowing and seeking and seek to understand. We can get prideful. Paul talks about it at 1 Corinthians 13. Knowledge puffs up. Oh, I already know that. I know this. It puffs up. Why? Because we think we know this, especially in our age where we come from a Greco-Roman philosophy where knowledge is elevated. I'm so intelligent. Look at my grade point average. I have this and, oh, I know that scripture and I can quote these things. And remember, great. But do you understand what you're reading? Another scripture talks about get understanding, though it costs you everything. I think that's Proverbs. Don't remember where. But though it costs you everything, get understanding. Don't confuse knowing with understanding. Apply your heart to understanding. Ask questions that seek deeper meanings and applications. All right, before we go on to our next one, make sure you pause and you have written out some applications for yourself. How does this apply for me? How will I seek diligently with all my heart? Again, I have a, a study that you can download in the notes, or you can just have a piece of paper and just start writing. What's moving your spirit? Because I want you, I want us to be in the right side of Yeshua when he comes and says, I know you because you have sought me diligent. I want to hear the father's words more than anything else to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've taken what I gave you, the message here, the word of God, and you've been faithful with it. That's all he can ask, whether it be one talent, two talent. Five. You took what I gave you and you were faithful. What is he giving you right now on your mind and your spirit that you need to be faithful to? Call out for insight. Cry aloud for understanding. Again, we're asking questions humbly. We're not taking a position that we know everything. We're just asking. It may be through uh, reading commentaries or asking other people and, and looking up things, podcasts and videos, and we're just humbly seeking. <clears throat> this may mean men mentorship. Who can I call in my life for mentorship or accountability? Doing research, doing study, praying, meditating, beseeching the Father. Notice that some of these things are crossing over. Why? Because it's the same spirit. It's one that I want to get this. I want to understand this. I want to be diligent in how I do this. Let nothing else rival the intensity and the sincerity by which I seek his word. Let nothing else rival that. Let not my uh, excitement about watching sports or playing them. Let not my excitement about some food or TV shows. Everyone should know. Not that we're trying to please anyone, but it should be so obvious. Just like it was with, was with Yeshua. They said he always went off to pray somewhere. They just knew it's, it's part of his life. That is clear. This is your thing. This is number one and nothing's close. You're all into it. Be open to correction and learning. There are some things in our minds and our spirit that are going to be need to be corrected. Even if you're well learned, whether you're young, old or experienced or inexperienced, it needs to be corrected. I didn't understand. That's what it was saying. Oh, right, let me take some time to see that perspective. Connect with like-minded communities. So I don't know if you're in a community already, at a church, or a group of people you meet with virtually. I'm in the process of creating a community I want to invite you to join, um, but I will haven't put it up yet, but I'll be sending this a link, so looking out for that. Um, creating a community for like-minded individuals who really want to know Yahweh and be in a community of like-minded people trying to apply that to their lives today. And then look for it as for hidden treasure. It's silver and hidden treasure. What does that mean? with great carefulness and intense intention, right? Because if we're looking just casually, like I, I lost a dollar, that's one thing. But if there's a million dollars locked away somewhere in a house or in a field, oh boy, I'm talking about we turn it up. He says, look for it like that. I'm not just saying, oh, I can't find it. You know, I got four girls and um, I asked them to do something for me, for me. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out that like, but if it was for you, you would have figured it out because it's important to you. Do it like that. He says, seek it with that intensity, with that excitement, with the hope of a great reward, right? So we're looking through it, knowing it, that this promise is true, that we will understand the fear of Yahweh. We will understand the knowledge of Yah. We, this is a hope. There's treasure at the end of this. This is good. It doesn't have to be just that I love God. And I'm just going to do it because he told me to do it. No, there's hope. And he tells us that many times to be excited about the rewards that come now and later. Knowing, having faith, that your efforts are worth it. It's worth the time. It's worth the money. It's worth the energy. 
it's worth the attention. It's worth putting aside uh, others and saying, no, I'm turning this off. I'm turning that off. I'm tuning into this. It's worth it. That's what we do when we look for it for treasure. We know that it's going to be worth the effort that it takes to find it. Just like the story of the man that Yeshua tells who, who buried a treasure in the field. Um, he bought the whole field when he found it there. It's worth it because the treasure is far, far outweighs the cost of the field. Well, the treasure that we're looking for far outweighs the cost of the energy and the time and the money. Whatever we put in is far outweighs. It's priceless. Peace is priceless that we get from that process. With diligence and persistence, that word comes up again, diligence, persistence. I'm going to keep going with patience and commitment. That means I, you know, I, I'm, the, I'm the kind of person I get excited about something, starting something real strong, but I fizzle out in the end. And I've had to work on that. No, no, no. He says, when you're looking for a treasure, you keep on going. You're patient about it. I'm committed to this process. This may take you days. It may take you years. And you're never going to get to the pinnacle of I got it all. But you're committed to continuing to grow in your understanding and your fear of Yahweh and your relationship with him. Then finally, understand and find the fear and knowledge of Yahweh. Deep personal relationship with God. Acknowledging his majesty and love and responding in obedience and trust. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. This is where you start. Then you'll you'll finally be on the starting place. Remember, seeking God is the beginning of our journey and knowledge of the Holy One, understanding. So we'll start this with fear in Yahweh. You're in the right place. I don't know where you are. If you've been walking with God a while, if you not sure where you are and you want to figure it out. This is a good place to start. Matter of fact, this is the place to start seeking him. It's time to get up and get your sights set and your goal on a relationship with him. That's the seeking process. You got to start it. It's not just simply reading the Bible or praying or going to church. The whole act is I'm seeking something. I'm not just trying to acquire a new religion or renew rituals that make me feel good. Too many have got caught up in this. Attending all the ceremonies and the traditions and doing it. And thinking that somehow by acquiring all these rituals and religions and days and doing this and not doing that. Then I've arrived. No, no, no. It's never been about that. All those things were to point to Yahweh. Seek him in your quiet moments. In your closet moments. When no one else is around, you're still seeking him. These other things Sure, because that's part of the process of you doing those. But that's not the goal. Truly to know him, truly to know him and better yet, be known by him. Because remember, those were the words Yeshua said that was so impacting. I don't know you. I don't know you. And I want to be known by him where he says, well done. Well done, Brandon. Well done. You can put your name in there. He knows you by name. The encouraging part is that as you begin this journey, as you come, he will begin to run to you because he's been seeking us forever. He set us up for this moment. He can't wait. James 4 says, come near to God. And guess what? He will come near to you again. You see the condition. You see the prerequisite. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Notice that right after he says that. There's a process of cleansing and purifying. These go together because as we come, we should be purifying ourselves, right? Don't be, don't make the mistake that many have and say, well, I can't come, but until I'm clean, you're never going to get clean. <laughs> you're never going to get clean. You can get, listen to it. You can get everything dirty without getting anything clean, but you can't get anything clean without getting something dirty. I know you might have to pause that. Let it sink in. You can get everything dirty without getting anything clean, but you can't get anything clean without getting something dirty. Why am I telling you that? Because you need Yeshua. You need Yeshua in the process of cleaning. You need the, him in the process of purification. You have to go through him to get clean. It's not possible. But in that process, there should be purification. But know that God is meeting you. He says, come near to God and he will come near to you. That's such an exciting invitation, isn't it? As you take your steps toward him, he says, I'm coming, baby. I'm coming, honey. I see your son. I see your baby. I see your daughter. Whatever endearment you want to put there that that appeals to you. I heard that a lot growing up. But know that this is what 
how God sees us. And I can't leave this principle without talking about the prodigal son story, right? The prodigal son story that God, the, the Yeshua came up with this story, by the way. It feels so real because we've heard it so long, but he came up with this story to illustrate this very point. That his son, two sons, one of the sons says, I want my inheritance. He demands it from his father, takes it and go lives um, in, in, in worldly ways and pursuing women and everything that appeals to his desire. Once he ran out, he came back home. He came back home and he came to his senses in Luke 15, verse 20, it says, and the prodigal son arose and came to his father. And that's what we need to do. Look at this. Look at this process. Again, Yeshua tells the story. He makes it up. He's not telling something he observed. He's trying to show us step by step and personally crafted a story to help us see this. He rose and came to his father. What is he doing? He's seeking. He came to his father. He came to his father. That's just so good alone. He came to his senses and began to come to his father where he was supposed to be. But when he was still a great way off, he was still a good distance off. I get goosebumps thinking about this because this guy could have been a hundred yards. He could have been half a mile. I don't know. But the father's obviously older by uh, 20, I mean, uh, 30, 40, 50, who knows how many years it doesn't say, but the father is of age and he sees the boy a long way off. His father saw him, had compassion on him and ran while the boy was in tears. Likely, while the boy was groveling, barely dragging his feet, because I'm sure he wasn't running in excitement, but in fearful hope of acceptance. While the boy was in transition, still getting out of his funk, the dad said, I see you, son. I see you. Again, this is a story that Yeshua crafted to help us see the father. As we come, as we're seeking him with all of our hearts, he says, I'll meet you there. I'm not going to meet you halfway. I just need you to take a step. I just need you to take two because you can't take half because I'll carry you. I'll catch you before you fall. But I see what you're doing. Some of us right now with where we are just need to start taking that step. You just need to start taking that first step and that second step. That's going to mean repentance. That's going to mean turning around from some things that's obvious in your life right now. You may have fooled a lot of people in your religiousness. You may have looked a certain way in your wickedness and just out there doing whatever you want. I don't know where you are, but I have to speak of all things because he says, wherever you are, if you're still alive, listening to this right now. If you're still able to hear the words that's coming out of my mouth, he says, you have a chance to come to the father and take a step. And when he sees you taking a step, he says, I'm coming running. I see you. I see you starting. I see. I didn't say you're going to be perfect. You may have stumbled on the way, but I see you coming. He says, I want you, son. I want your daughter. I know where you are. I know you've been having some form of godliness, but you've been denying the power. Come on. I know you've been doing everything that you made you feel good. But now you say, look, I just want to surrender to whatever makes you feel good. He says, I see you. And he fell and it says he, he had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Hmm. What intimate? He wants intimacy with us. He wants to be close with us. He's not saying, ill you stink. I can believe what you've done. I'm not going to touch you until you. He came just like he was. And I don't imagine he washed all his stuff and clothes and the journey with it. Whatever he was, he was coming as he was. He says, I kiss you the way you are. I'll hug you the way you are with all the stuff on you just as you are now. Some mamas and daddies won't do that. <laughs> They're like, look, you got to get this out. But most will. Most good moms and dads will. And Yahweh is no exception. He leads out and shows an example of what to be done. He says, I'll take you just like that. Don't they give you joy? You still have time, if you're listening to this now, to seek him with all your heart. In verse 21, and the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. And in your sight, he's reminded by the sin that he's played in, that he's been entrenched in. He says he's probably more than humbled that he's been treated as such. I've sinned blatantly, openly, and I'm no longer worthy to even be called your son. See, the boy reasoned earlier that I could just be a servant. I'd be fine because of how gross my sin was and my attitude. I'm just happy to be a servant and eat with the pigs. How can I be called your son? Yeah, Yeshua tells us this story because he wants us to know that's exactly what we're called because of the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach. He allows 
our sins to be forgiven and washed away. And he says, no, come anyway. I see you. We couldn't make these steps if it wasn't for Yeshua's sacrifice. But he says, I already made the sacrifice come. You have a part to play. You need to seek. You need to reach out and you will find me. I already see you. I already found you. There's no point. God is saying, I, I, I know where you are, but I need you to come so I can come get you. I want to close with this thought, this sentiment that priority one has always been to seek God. Always to seek God. No matter if you're starting out or the middle or toward the end of your journey, it's always number one, seek God first. We see that in Matthew where it says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. See, the, the, the worries about our life is what causes us to put that first. We're seeking, what am I going to do? What am I? And here's some of the things. What, what will you eat? What will you drink or know about your body? What am I going to put on? <laughs> um, it's not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes. And look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Come on. He's saying, look at the, I love the PowerPoint Yeshua had. Ain't that a good PowerPoint? As he's talking, he got a PowerPoint. He's like, look at the, look at the, he had pictures that's living and active. It's the first PowerPoint, but he's making the point. No pun intended. That look, the birds that are here today didn't go on tomorrow. He later talks about the grass of the field was better clothed. Look at them. Surely you're more valuable than they. Now, when you see the birds stressing out, okay, then you can work. But they just go about their time. He takes care of them. He'll take care of us. But we need to seek his kingdom and his righteousness first. Therefore, do not worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Can I remind you that that spirit and attitude, that's a worldly one. That's not us. We're not going to be like those who, oh, man, it's just trying to get through. And I got this and I get, we're overcome by the words of the world. That's that's we struggle with that. That's a thought. But that should not be where we live. Our where we live should be. I seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And I'm not going to allow myself to be consumed with worry. It doesn't mean we can't think about those things. Of course, that's life. But my consumption is seeking his kingdom and righteousness. For your heavenly father, he knows you need all these things. And verse uh, 32 says, he knows you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. He knows you need them. He knows you need them. And you just ask, seek and knock. But you don't have to be consumed with worry about them. 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. I want to go back to 33. It says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first. I love the order because we're inundated with so many other things that are jockeying for our attention and our focus and our energy, demanding that we seek that first. You open your phones, you have all kinds of notifications and apps saying me, me, me. You have phone calls that come through on a cell phone like never before now from all kinds of telemarketers and strangers and me, me, this issue is important. We got solicitors knocking on the door, turning the TV on, this is important. Oh my goodness, did you see the news? And everything's important. He says, look, it's easy. Let me put it in order for you. Seek first. Seek first his righteousness. What's right by him? Not what's not wrong. What's right by God in this situation? As a father, as a mother, as a son, as a daughter, as an uncle, as an aunt, as a teacher, as a student, as an employer, as an employee, what's right by God? Let me filter all things through that lens first. His kingdom. What's important for his kingdom and his righteousness? I love it. The peace. Let's start there. And that peace that transcends understanding is a serious witness and message for us all. I want to summarize God's plan of salvation begins with seeking. I pray that you're already on that plan. I pray that this message has galvanized you and stirred you up to seek in a different way. Our seeking must be accompanied by diligence, diligence, wholeheartedness of all those who seek. Remember, only will find only a few will find. Don't get comfortable thinking I'm in a crowd of billions who will get it. He says, no, only a few out of those who are seeking, just the ones who seeking, which is a few, even fewer will get it. We'll find a narrow way. Be among those who find a narrow way because you are seeking with all your heart. 
Simply being religious is not equivalent to seeking the truth. Go to church, read your Bible, pray, serve the poor, be nice to your neighbors. All those things are nice and good, but they are not a replacement for wholehearted truth seeking. They do. They are fruits of such. But diligence and being wholehearted is what he's after. Seek with all your heart. Ask, seek and knock. As we draw near to God, it's encouraging to know that he's drawn near to us. We take a few steps. He takes off running in our condition because he loves us and wants to reconcile with us. Seeking God's kingdom and righteousness is always, always priority number one. After this study, if nothing else you get, let that be the order you seek everything. You look through everything. Before I, when I, before I, uh, when I want to put something on, what am I going to wear? Well, let's think about God's righteousness and kingdom. What major should I pick? Well, what is uh, uh, seeking first? What, what is seeking his righteousness and his kingdom look like? And through that lens, it's not about me. It's not about others. It's about what does God's righteousness and kingdom look like being put in first place in everything in my life? Two questions. How have you been seeking God with all your heart? It's not a question that you need to answer to me. I'll be slow to answer this question, but I'll be more quick to be introspective and find out in what ways can I better seek God with all my heart? Because you can't go wrong there. But it's dangerous to think I have nothing else to learn. I've already arrived. How will you see God in his kingdom differently after the study? Hopefully you wrote down some practical things for yourself that says, I need to go after this differently. Proverbs 2 gave us a, a list of how we can dial into that. Don't let this be just another video of something you watch and you say that was cool information. Put it to practice. If you do so, we become just like those who heard his word but did nothing. We become like those who we listened to these messages and he taught in our streets. We ate with him and drank with him, but we did not do the father's will. And he says, go away from me. You're an evildoer. Evildoer. That's how it looks to Yahweh. Thank you for tuning in. Subscribe if you want to hear more like this. Share this message out with others. May Yahweh bless the hearers and doers of his word. I'll see you next lesson.